Hi everyone, good morning and good afternoon. My name is Carmen Yu. I am the Marketing Coordinator at eFolder and your host for today's event. Welcome to our eFolder Partner Chat Series. This webinar series brings together leading eFolder partners for business-oriented discussions. Today's topic is HIPAA policies and best practices from a partner. Today we are joined by Dan Gossi, COO and HIPAA Privacy Officer at BMI Networking. Before we go through today's agenda, let's first cover a few housekeeping items. Today's session is being recorded. The recorded version of the webinar will be made available on eFolder's YouTube channel. We will also make copies of the slides available to those who registered for the event. With over 400 people registered for today's session, we have put all participants in listen-only mode. You can enjoy the audio portion of today's event by either streaming it on your computer or dialing in over the phone. Your questions are strongly encouraged throughout. We have planned a special Q&A section at the end of today's discussion, but you may submit your questions as we go along and we will try to address them on the fly. Today's presentation follows a logical flow. After introducing our partner guests, we'll go over what HIPAA is and discuss why MSPs must comply with the Act. We will then go into an interactive back and forth discussion with Dan about the administrative, physical, and technical safeguards he's implemented at DMI Networking and talk about some of the best practices for MSPs who are working towards compliance. Finally, we will open up the floor to questions from everyone in the audience. Now let me introduce our partner guest. Dan Gossi began his career with HIPAA in 2005, managing the trauma registry at Santa Rosa Memorial Hospital. There he liaised with county EMS and provided reports on trauma cases and trends in Sonoma County. In 2009, Dan worked with Offsite Care Inc., a telemedicine provider where he does, designed a database for measuring the efficacy of telemedicine at local hospitals. He reported on telemedicine's impact on patient care and its financial impact on the hospital. After arriving at DMI Networking, Dan became the HIPAA Privacy Officer and COO, where he developed policies and procedures meeting the requirements of the 2013 Omnibus, Omnibus Rule. He currently consults with dentists on behalf of DMI Networking with the aim of strengthening their compliance with HIPAA. Dan graduated from Sonoma State University in 2004 with a Bachelor of Science in Physics and is a Certified Specialist in Trauma Registry. Dan, thanks for joining us and welcome. Thank you, Carmen, for inviting me to take part. Um, as Carmen mentioned, I'm COO of DMI Networking. We provide uh, managed services to dental clients in California, uh, as well as remote services nationwide. Um, a little bit about us, we began as the IT arm of a company called Datacon Dental Systems, which is a practice management software for dentists. It was actually founded in 1973. About six years ago, we split off to support all dental software and hardware, and we dropped the Datacon name. They got to retain the technicians. Um, our senior tech has been with us for over 15 years. Um, one of the services we provide, as Carmen mentioned, is a HIPAA consultation for dentists. During these consultations, we begin the process of completing a risk assessment, and, and we center just solely on the security rule um, and the IT arm of the law, so we're not um, experts in all of the, the, clerical, um, the clerical parts of the law, so we're really just focusing in on the technology. Um, we identify the risks to the data on the network, and we discuss different ways to mitigate the risks and close the gaps. Great. Thanks, Dan. So you guys currently have 120 dental clients that you guys are doing managed services for. Is that correct? Yeah, so we have um, 120 or so contracted clients, um, and then we have a host of, you know, kind of break, fix, and a la carte clients as well. Um, I think we probably have around 300 offices that we support in some fashion, 120 of which have the full managed services plan with us. Okay, wow, that's a lot of clients. Keeps us pretty busy. <laughs> that's good. So uh, let's talk a little bit about what HIPAA is. So HIPAA stands for Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, and it was first passed into law by Congress in 1996. The act was first created to improve health insurance portability and accessibility. 
Title I of the Act ensures that employees leaving a job would still be able to retain their health insurance coverage without complications. And it also prohibits employee group plans from excluding coverage for an employee due to any pre-existing condition. Title II of HIPAA reduces health care fraud and abuse by ensuring the confidentiality and security of protected health information, known as PHI or electronic PHI. Um, Title II basically regulates how PHI can be transmitted, maintained, and disclosed. Protected health information also known as PHI, refers to any combination of an identifier and health information. An identifier could be a name, phone number, or a medical record number. There are actually 18 identifiers that are recognized by HIPAA. Covered entities who must comply with HIPAA include health plans, healthcare clearinghouses, and any healthcare providers who transmit PHI or EPHI. So HIPAA has really set industry-wide standards for how PHI should be handled. The privacy and security rules are part of Title II of HIPAA, and they create guidelines for day-to-day -day operations in the business of a covered entity. The privacy rule protects patient health information by mandating in which situations and with whom PHI can be shared. The security rule defines standards for protecting the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of EPHI. For today's webinar, it's really going to be the security rule that we are going to be focusing on because this is the rule in HIPAA that sets standards for certain policies and processes to be in place in a business to ensure the security of PHI. The reason the rules of HIPAA should not be taken lightly is that the cost for noncompliance can be substantial. The cost for noncompliance can be up to $50,000 per violation or up to $1.5 million a year. So to give you an idea of just how much HIPAA can really cost, a dermatology clinic in Massachusetts lost a flash drive and was fined $150,000. Another provider in Massachusetts lost lost laptop and settled the case for $1.5 million. A lost hard drive in Alaska cost the organization $1.7 million. So the penalty for lost PHI can really go high depending on how much patient data is lost. So why does HIPAA matter to MSPs? In September of 2013, the final HIPAA omnibus rule was passed. This rule expanded the act so that business associates of covered entities must comply with HIPAA. A business associate is defined as an entity who supports covered entities by performing duties that involve the usage, storage, or transmission of PHI. So business associates are also subcontractors who support or perform duties for other business associates. An MST or VAR who manages data and security for a med medical client are considered a business associate. And MSPs are also considered business associates if they manage data and security for another business associate, such as an accounting firm that provides services for a hospital. So really, once this omnibus rule was passed in 2013, a lot of MSPs had to start becoming HIPAA compliant. So Dan, before we get, before we get into how MSPs can become HIPAA compliant, I have a few questions for you. Uh, when did you decide to become HIPAA compliant? Um, well, I first came to BMI networking a little over two years ago, and it was before the um, OMS rule was passed. We knew it was on the horizon. So one of the tasks I was initially um, tasked with was to get us into compliance. Um, prior, prior to the rule, we did have a lot of policies and procedures for our best practices, but they weren't specific to HIPAA, and they really um, weren't as detailed as they are now. Um, so when I was when I was hired on, my first role was to develop these and also take on the training and implementing of these policies. So it was really, I'd say maybe six months before the omnibus rule passed, we wanted to um, get everything in order before that happened. I see. Um, so Dan, how far do you go to help your clients become HIPAA compliant? Well, um, we go as far as we can. Um, we want, we want our clients to know that they can resource us, so we provide um, consultations and, and any kind of HIPAA-related 
uh, information at no cost. And ideally, we want all of our clients to be compliant or at least understand what the law is asking for. So really, to that end, we document the, the current risks to their data and discuss all the multiple methods for meeting compliance on any one issue. And since many of the requirements are addressable, we can kind of brainstorm with the client on a solution that works for them. And that said, you know, sometimes clients don't really want to be HIPAA compliant, so we can't force feed it to them. We're really there as a resource, um, and we want people to resource us just to, you know, just to help um, pretty much the industry as a whole, just to keep everybody compliant. Right, I see. So what about for DMI networking? Have you ever sought outside help to become HIPAA compliant? Yeah, for sure. Um, so when we were starting out, as I said, we didn't have um, we didn't have the policies and procedures that we needed uh, once the omnibus rule was going to pass. So we did. We worked with a company called Compliance Helper, um, and they were they were very good because they gave us um, pretty much a, a broad bunch of templates, and it was probably about a two month process to get everything in order. But they were able to kind of review all of our policies, um, any of the changes or new policies that we implemented and just let us know that we're on the right track or change things that were not compliant solutions. And so that's the help that we got from them. We still continue to um, to resource them whenever there are changes to the law. Um, and I think it's important, um, you know, when you're just first learning about HIPAA compliance, it's a pretty nebulous, broad law, um, and it's good to get some expert help, whether it's just a single consultation from somebody or, you know, having somebody sort of you know, send you reminders of what needs to be done and just kind of keep you in line. I think it's important. It's a lot to take on. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely a lot. Um, so now let's talk about how MSPs can start becoming HIPAA compliant. So under the security rule, covered entities and business associates need to have administrative, physical, and technical safeguards in place to protect PHI or EPHI. Administrative safeguards are policies and procedures created in the business of an MSP that define how the business will comply with HIPAA. These written policies should outline how the business of an MSP will maintain its HIPAA compliance. This would include detailing who, is, who in the business has access to PHI or EPHI, training programs for handling of EPHI, and how violations will be detected and corrected. MSPs also need to have a written contingency plan as part of the administrative safeguard that outlines how the MSP will ensure the integrity and availability of EPHI in the event of an emergency or disaster. So Dan, um, do you mind sharing with us what administrative safeguards BMI networking has implemented? Sure. Um, so administrative safeguards, it's kind of the, the starting point of your compliance process. And, the first and foremost, the most important thing that you can do is to begin a risk assessment. So the risk assessment is a living document. It means that you know it identifies your current issues as well as outlines a roadmap to compliance. And you're not going to be able to just suddenly be compliant in a couple months. There's always going to be um, you know things that you're working on, and the risk assessment kind of allows you to um, you know begin a roadmap to it and just address all the issues in a fashion that works with your budget. Um, so for our risk assessment, it's it's more than, you know, just a spreadsheet. We actually have a, um, a full binder, and whenever anything is, is added or removed or anything like that, it's always documented. So it's this living document sort of, uh, sort of thing. Um, we also have, you know, the administrative uh, safeguards that we use. We have um, our yearly policy review and training and documenting our policies for approved software um, on the workstations. We enforce that through our monitoring software to be able to uh, ensure that nothing is installed on the machines that we haven't already approved. Um, we also have our password policies outlined and, um, you know, employee onboard and offboarding. And finally, the business continuity plan, as you mentioned. Um, Basically, it also needs to be tested once a year, but it's, you know, how do we get back up? How do we ensure that we continue our services? And that's, that's important for both business associates and covered entities. Um, part of the HIPAA law, one of the A's is, is um, you know, accountability and accessibility, and you just want to be able to, uh, you know, keep your, keep your compliance going even if your server goes down. So that's sort of the, the goal of that. Right. 
Got it. So let's get into physical safeguards. Physical safeguards are standards to control the physical access to protected health information. Policies and procedures need to be written to control how employees of MSPs use their workstations, how they access equipment containing EPHI, and how to properly remove or transfer software containing EPHI. So Dan, uh, is there anything you'd like to add about what a physical safeguard is or um, how does BMI networking address physical safeguards? Sure. Um, so really, physical security is, is huge for physical safeguards. And there is, I, I do want to say, there is some overlap between physical and technical safeguards. And I'll get into that a little bit later. And so, th so one physical safeguard we have is we have our video cameras um, and alarm system in the building. That's kind of like the, um, the entry level stuff. It's a really good idea to have it. Um, and we also, we've designed, we've designed our office in a way so that people who walk into our office, they don't have physical access to the bench where we work on PCs. Um, our, our biggest risk to breach um, is actually when we are working on client PCs here because we don't hold data here in any other fashion. So if a non-compliant client you know, gives us a PC to work on and it has patient information on it, then that's, our, that's pretty much our biggest um, exposure risk right there. Um, so only authorized employees can be in that area and people have to sign in. Um, I'm pretty stringent on having all the forms um, you know, updated and people, you know, are signing in. So we have it uh, locked up and every machine is logged as to when it got here, who brought it in, target date, and the work that needs to be done on it. Um, so, and then, as I mentioned, the physical safeguards do overlap with the technical safeguards. And an example of that is um, we'll perform a test restore for a client on a bench where we send them an encrypted backup drive, they send it back to us, and then we um, will restore it to a server and then give them a remote access, but we'll only do it, um, you know, we won't keep that data overnight. So basically it's all scheduled where, you know, we get it restored, we get them on, and we wipe it as soon as possible. And by addressing that, that one really big point of exposure, we've really reduced our, our liability there. Um, and then aside from that, you can consider, you know, workout, workstation lockout policies and, uh, log out the remote sessions. That is kind of a technical safeguard, but it also falls into our policies for physical safeguards as well. So there's just, there's a lot of overlap there. I see. And Dan, how does DMI networking handle um, machines that come into your business or your office with unencrypted uh, EPHI data on it? Sure. So we have a, a room in the back. We have two benches. We have a, a bench in the front and a bench in the back. And if it's a, a high-risk um, computer or something like that, then, then it's behind a locked door in our bench back there. And only our authorized employees can get down there and get on there. Um, additionally, it's not hooked into our network um, unless we absolutely have to get on it. Um, so I'm, this is another thing I'm kind of a stickler about. It's really, really important that uh, we reduce our exposure. And so that's that's kind of how we go about doing that. I see. Great. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. So moving on to technical safeguards. Um, technical safeguards are standards to control access to computer systems in order to maintain the security of EPHI. These standards include password encryption, proper firewalls, and network security measures. MSPs also need to complete a documented risk analysis on the security of the EPHI they manage. So Dan, um, do you want to elaborate more about what a documented risk analysis is or how you guys address technical safeguards? Yeah, for sure. So the, um, the risk analysis, it, it does come, you know, at the source it comes from our risk assessment um, in, in about limiting, you know, all the exposure that you can. So. Specifically, um, some of the technical safeguards, every technician has their own account uh, for every portal of access that they use. And, you know, there's password policies that are uh, enforced. Every 90 days, they have to change it. It can't be one they've used before. It has to be complexity requirements. Um, we also have a, a breach reporting system. So it's the same one that we actually deploy to clients. And if it's an incorrect password is entered more than five times, I'll, I'll get an alert about it. If it's on a server, it's more of a, a high-level alert, so I'll actually get texted on it. But um, most of the time, it's one of our employees just forgetting 
the password for a client system, which does happen. And um, we'll get alerts for high traffic on one of our network ports, which can possibly identify potential malware. Um, or, you know, it could also identify if somebody is downloading a movie or, or doing something like that. We've, we've never had that happen, but um, having that in place kind of ensures that, that we would know if there's uh, high traffic coming from one of our ports. Um, and then, you know, there's, there's kind of some obvious technical safeguards as well, such as just antivirus, patch management, um, email attachment scanning, blocking apps that aren't, uh, that aren't approved. We also block uh, the ability to install apps from temp folders. That's a, a place that a lot of viruses come from. And um, all of our PCs have non-administrator accounts to our network. So um, these, these fall into best, best practices. Um, and we really, there is never any PHI on our workstations aside from when we're um, on a remote session. And so our remote sessions are always encrypted and um, auto log off and they're all audited. So um, let's see, yeah, and we, we can't always ensure that um, our clients are going to encrypt their machines. So really where we focus the majority of our efforts is, um, is on those machines where we really just, you know, put all the safeguards we can into place on those. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Um, going back to the text alerts that you get uh, when an employee en enters the wrong password or locks himself out of an account, um, is there a software that you're using to manage all of that? Yeah, there is. We, um, we use a software called Enable. Um, there are a lot of different softwares out there for MSPs. Um, we've used Kaseya here and we've used Autotask Endpoint Management and they all have that ability. Um, where you really just customize your, you know, what do you want to be alerted about, and it can it can be really granular. Um, it's extremely powerful, and we we use it in house as well as deploy it to clients. Um, it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty good stuff. I, I like it. Nice. Thanks for sharing. Um, before we move on, uh, I'm just going to check to see if any questions have come in about administrator physical and technical safeguards. Okay. Um, so Dylan asked, how do you handle monitoring and correlation of logs to systems and data? So yeah, so um, some of the monitoring we do obviously are from, from those breaches. Um, the covered entity is responsible for reviewing um, the logs that they have, their audit logs. Um, and then just like that, we're, we're responsible for reviewing ours. So, Every quarter, I'm reminded by our, our folks over at Compliance Helper to go through, because um, sometimes you get so busy and you need a little reminder. Um, but uh, yeah, just to review all the audit logs, just to see if there's any patterns or anything like that that for some reason wouldn't have been alerted. But um, you know, that's never happened. We've always been um, alerted right away when something happens. So um, Dylan, does that answer your question? And I hope it does. I hope it does too. Um, but he also asked, he also asked, um, how do you handle the destruction of data on end of life PCs or servers? Sure. Okay, so we use um, it, it's a program called Nuke and Boot and Nuke, and um, it does like three different. Um, it goes through three different times on all the bits, and it just kind of randomly writes zeros and ones on them. And that's a DOD compliant system for wiping them. Um, we do sometimes get, uh, you know, really old systems that are still using tape backups. We have a partnership with a hardware shredding company that we, you know, we lock those up until, you know, once a quarter we'll, we'll give them to them and then they'll actually shred them. Um, so the hard drives are always, um, always, you know, um, destroyed to those standards. Okay, I see. And uh, Brandon is asking, uh, what what was the name of the software that you used for the text alert? Um, I believe you said enable, right? Yeah, for the test restores, it's a little different. So um, since there are so many different ways to do a backup, um, we really have to restore based on what they're using. So if they're using Shadow Protect, then we use one of our Shadow Protect um, recovery CDs to do it. Um, if they're using Windows Server Backup, then we can, you know, uh, restore it. It's actually very easy with Windows Server Backup. As long as they're backing up to encrypted hard drives, that is compliant. 
Um, so yeah, it really just depends. And then uh, once it's up there, we um, install join me. We just do a join dot me, which is an encrypted HIPAA compliant way to do a one time, um, you know, one time remote session. So it works for us because you know we're only using it one time and then we wipe it. Um, other than that, we also have log me in that we could put on there, but um, there's not really a need to do that. So we just get them on with join me and then wipe the computer. Okay, great. Thanks for sharing. Sure. So uh, moving on to business associate agreement. Um, a business associate agreement, also known as a BAA, is a contract stating that a business associate will appropriately safeguard EPHI. So this is something that covered entities should sign with their MSPs, and MSPs should also sign BAAs with their backup and cloud vendors. MSPs who sign BAAs with clients give them the peace of mind and confidence that the MSP will be operating their business and handling data according to HIPAA guidelines. And MSPs who sign BAAs with backup and cloud vendors can hold these vendors accountable if they are ever in violation of HIPAA as a result of the vendor's noncompliance. So, Dan, do you sign BAAs with all of your clients? We do. Um, we actually require it, even if they're only on break fix. Um, the, so the specific requirement is actually that the client should generate the BAA for us to sign, so it kind of goes from them to us. But since many times the clients don't have that, um, you know, we have our template. Even if, uh, even if they do have it, we want to incorporate our template into theirs because it really uh, defines the scope of how we access their data and, and you know, where the data is in terms of um, our access to it. So you know, when you're developing your own uh, business associate agreement, you definitely want to have a legal review. Um, that's another you know, kind of third party thing that you're going to need. Um, it's really your best protection when you're supporting your clients. And so it really needs to be by the letter of the law. It needs to really um, address all those issues. Um, so we have our BAA valid uh, for the length of the contract if they're on a contract. And we have a line in there that says that the BAA is valid for 20 years, because you do actually have to have an end date um, to the BAA. And then, but then we have the caveat, unless the client wishes to sever the agreement. And if the server, if the client does want to sever the agreement, then we remove all, all of our software from it. And we, we basically stop supporting the client, um, or at least we have that signed. Um, you know, that signed uh, kind of dismissal of that agreement helps keep us protected. Um, so the BAA clearly defines the scope of all of our access to the data. So um, examples of this, are, it just kind of mentions the encryption that's in place, um, you know, with the backup through eFolder or through, through others, it's encrypted before it's sent off-site, um, which just kind of outlines that we don't have access to the non-encrypted data um, right. It's it's basically that's that's the goal is just outline everything that's where you where you can get hands or your text can get hands on the data, and then um, you know protect you for anything that's not in that scope. I see. And you mentioned that the client is supposed to present um, MSPs with the BAA, but if they don't bring it up, uh, will you guys kind of bring that up during the consultation phase? Yeah, for sure. And um, when we're going through our HIPAA consultations, that's one of the the big ones. It's like definitely get a BAA signed with everybody, and then you know we offer to give them ours. They can make changes if they'd like. Um, there's usually no mean, no reason to make changes. Honestly, the the only thing that um, some people have a problem with is that the BAA is valid for 20 years unless the client wishes to sever it. Um, that's really just because we need an, an end date, so that sometimes gets changed. Um, sometimes they want to say, you know, let's renew it every year, and then that's that's fine to do as well. Um, we don't really update our BAA very often, so there's, um, I think once once since I've been here, we've updated it and had to send it out to to everybody. Um, but you know, they're pretty amenable to it. Everybody wants to be protected, and so that's an easy one. It's, you know, people want to sign it. Right. Okay, and you guys do have a general template. We do. Yeah, and it's something that we developed through. Um, basically, we we had one, and then we had compliance helper help us, you know, kind of strengthen it, and then we had a legal review of it um, by one of our our partner lawyers, and um, we do use that template whenever we can. 
at least as a starting point. Okay, and I think you already kind of touched on uh, what's included in the VAA, uh, but you know, is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, no, it's really, I mean, the most important thing is just to define the scope of access to data. That's, um, you know, if there's anything in there that's uh, not addressing something or if there's any kind of gray area where you could read it and say, oh, they have access to my unencrypted backup data, then you, you want to address that and make sure that, so that you don't. Um, there's no one template for BAAs. Everybody's is going to look totally different. Um, and so it's just, you know, like I said, a really good idea to get a legal review of it. Okay. And uh, what about with your cloud and backup vendors? Do you uh, have one that you usually provide them to sign? Yeah, so actually what we do is we kind of do with them what they do with us. We, firstly, we won't partner with anyone if they won't sign a BAA. And then in general we get their template because they know the scope of their access to data. So we'll, you know, we'll read it over, make sure it makes sense, um, and then we usually just sign theirs. I see. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so more questions for you, Dan. Uh, how do you make sure that your employees at DMI Networking are trained on HIPAA? Sure. So we found, um, so we have eight employees here. It's a pretty pretty small office to, um, to manage. And, you know, we get very busy. And so what I've found is the best way to get everybody to review the policies is to ask them for edits. Um, I think that's really important because it kind of puts them uh, you know, it puts them kind of in the decision-making process, and I, and I think that they, you know, they they like to have their suggestions heard. Um, if they do make suggestions, then they're asked to review the law um, before they submit them to me. So, basically, I want to hear, you know, compliance suggestions, the policies, and that that works very well. Um, you know, that really ensures that they're going to read it. I think legally, all they really need to do is sign off that they read them. But um, this way is a little bit more proactive because then you know for sure that they're reading it. Um, yeah, and it, it, it's just nice to offer that to employees to say, hey, you know, you guys are, are the feet on the, are the hands on the ground there, and you know what might work best for you, and then is it compliant, and then maybe they can, you know, affect some change in their policies. Right. And do you um, make them? Do you require your employees to repeat training, say, on a yearly basis? Yeah, every year we go over the, the entire policy book. Um, we don't do it all at the same time. We kind of schedule it, um, you know, we schedule it maybe a couple weeks apart for everybody and just, just ask for the edits as, a, as that were. And we do sit down and have, uh, we have weekly staff meetings and so we're, we're constantly talking about HIPAA and talking about new practices that we're, that we're implementing. Um, yeah, so so I think there's a constant, there's sort of a constant thing going on, and then there's that yearly um, training that they actually sign off on, where they're actually reading our entire policy binder, and that's no small task. You know, it takes um, it takes a good couple of weeks. You know, when when one employee is going to start reviewing it, um, I can expect all their their work to be done in a couple of weeks. I see. Wow, that's a pretty long time. Yeah, we. I mean. Is, and anything with HIPAA is, is like this. I mean, you, you need a plan. That you don't have to have, like, a bunch of deadlines. It's just basically have your process in, in place. And, you know, our techs are very busy, so we, we want to, uh, you know, make sure that they have the time that they need to do it. I see. And do you have a way to detect noncompliance in your business? Um, yeah, so monthly um, our compliance is enforced through the technical safeguards. So, you know, with all the alerts that we get um, and reviewing all the training logs and yearly reviews of, of employee employee performance, that's that's an important one. When you're sitting down with your employee uh, for their yearly review, you can uh, you know kind of kind of look at their logs and see what they're doing, and uh, you know that's one way to kind of. I don't want to say keep an eye on them. There's a there's quite a bit of trust here, um, earned trust um, by our technicians. But that is one way to just make sure that um, that we're aware of what's going on here in management. Okay. And um, what about employees? Going back to employees, how do you um, for new employees who are onboarding, how do you get them uh, trained up on HIPAA? Right. So that's um, that's one where they're. Um, 
you know, basically within about a month, I want them to know all of our policies and um, every time we're training them on, you know, how do you support a client or how do you bring a, how do you check in a PC or, or anything like that, it's always with the undertone of, of HIPAA. It's like, this is a HIPAA form, this is what you need to do so that we're compliant and if they have questions, it's, um, you know, this is why it's compliant. And, Really, the, the best way to be compliant is um, for all of your techs to know what it takes to be compliant and to take it seriously. And I think we're lucky here um, because we have a lot of high performing technicians here that really want to do it uh, the right way. Um, right. So I think, yeah, I think if we had some problem employees, it would be a, a different story. Right now, it's not, um, it's not like that here. So, so luckily, we have very engaged people here. That's great. Yeah, having the right people is important. Yeah, for sure. Um, so are there any compliance best practices that you didn't previously consider, but you've learned over time that it's important? Um, yes, definitely. Um, so HIPAA, as I mentioned before, it's, it's a huge law. It's, it's very nebulous, and there's a lot of addressable issues, and there's a constant learning going on. and you know, new practices are adopted all the time. So one example um, is patch management, and that's keeping your, uh, keeping all your software up to date, um, you know, not using Windows XP, all that kind of stuff. About a year ago, the, the director of the Office of Civil Rights, um, OCR, they're actually the enforcement arm of HIPAA, so they're the ones that kind of bring the heat. Um, so the director of that organization made a statement um, saying that using current versions of software are necessary for compliance. So that was a huge statement because that kind of puts an end to the Windows XP debate. Some people are saying, you know, oh, it is compliant to use XP, and then this is like, now it's um, it's set in stone that no, actually it's not a supported operating system. And so that's that's one example. And then that said, you know, using Windows XP, just because you have it doesn't mean that you're not compliant. It means it needs to be in your risk assessment, assessment and you need to have your mitigation plan in place, and that's how you keep it compliant. But you definitely need to act on replacing unsupported software such as XP. And so patch management, I think, is the, the best example I can think of that, um, you know, that sort of became more, more concrete uh, over the past mm -hmm. year. Got it. So let's talk a little about your client's compliance. Um, MSPs can still do business with a client, even if the client is non-compliant. But um, it is important for the MSP to still act as a business associate and implement all the safeguards under the security rule in order to avoid liability or penalties due to your client's non-compliance. Um, so Dan, what are some common non-compliance solutions that you see your clients using? Um, well, there's a, there's actually quite a few. Um, I think the most the most common one is when they're doing their local backups. Many times they're not on encrypted drives, and um, that's definitely a big one. I actually the other day I came across a statistic um, that said for dental practices, over 50% of breaches came from physical theft of data. And why that's important is that across all industry, physical theft is only 17% the reason for breach. So it's, it's hugely different um, for dentists. And so, you know, looking into why that might be, it's kind of subjective because there's no specific study. Um, but it's very common for dentists to use flash drives or non-encrypted media for backup. So that's, that's a big one. And also, it's less common for a dental practice to have a domain server, uh, you know, managing the security there than, say, like in a financial firm or some other, you know, some other firm that has a lot of personal data. Um, another example, a lot of stuff we see is, uh, you know, out of date Flash and Java patch management stuff. Um, and then when we're coming into a new office, a lot of times we'll see that they're using free antivirus software, and that's that isn't compliant. And the reason it isn't compliant is that it's breaking the terms of service. Um, most free antivirus is licensed for home use, and it doesn't carry a business license, so that kind of puts it not only as a legal issue, but it becomes a HIPAA concern because then it's technically not supported software. Um, so we see we see that everywhere, or not everywhere, we see that at a lot of new uh, clients that they're using free antivirus and that, that's very common. 
Okay, so when you notice your clients are using for your home editions of antivirus, um, how do you start a conversation with them to maybe move them to a more compliant or more secure solution? Yeah, we just uh, we just let them know. We just say, you know, this, and if, it, if it's in the uh, form of our, our HIPAA consultations and we're going through their risk assessment, it's, it's very easy to bring up at that point. Um, otherwise, if we just happen to come across it, we just make sure to let them know. Um, that can be a little bit tough because, you know, a lot of times you're talking to the office manager and not to the actual practice owner, um, and sometimes that information doesn't get relayed. So we just do our best, you know, just do your best to, to let them know um, that it's a breach of license and it's a, it's a breach of HIPAA uh, compliance. Okay, and do you usually encounter client resistance when you're trying to move them to a paid antivirus software that might cost them some money versus the free version? I wouldn't say usually, but I'd say um, commonly. Um, there, there are definitely people that, you know, they want to, and, and this is true in a lot of different areas, but they want to do, you know, they've been in practice for 20 years. It's just, they're, what they're doing has worked for 20 years. They've never had a virus, or, you know, you get that kind of um, resistance to it. And, you know, it's, it's okay for them. I mean, it's, it's really not okay for them to practice in that way, but it's okay from our stand, standpoint because we're protected. Um, and all we can do is, is keep trying to, you know, get the message out. Um, you know, I think one of the travel, one of the problems we, we have is, you know, you're talking about HIPAA compliance and then it, it kind of sounds like you're trying to upsell or you're trying to, you know, make money and, and all this kind of stuff. And that, that's one of the reasons why our HIPAA consultations are always free. And it's a very high value service, I think, to, to help somebody with a risk assessment. And it's really, we just really want our clients to be compliant because we don't want to, you know, we don't want to have a client that gets breached, you know, quite honestly. Um, so yeah, and it's, you know, there's, of course, there's a solution that we deploy that, that we definitely like, but we're happy if they want to get TransMicro or they want to get something on their own. That's perfectly fine. Um, they're they're welcome to shop for their own, you know, antivirus, but but they do need to know that it's, um, you know, that it's just not a compliance solution. Right. And if they're stubborn about moving away from their uh, non-compliant solutions, will you will you still manage those solutions for them? We won't manage those specific solutions. No. Um, we'll manage the compliance solutions. We'll we'll do the work you know, the services that they'd like, and then, you know, the scope of our BAA is, is pretty clearly defined that this is where we have hands-on compliance for them. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, we will definitely, and then also whenever we do a, a consultation or something, we'll, we write it up, we sign it, it's, um, you know, it's, uh, um, it's a professional um, write-up, so it's all documented. Right. You know, this this is a risk to your system. This is our recommendations. We sign off on it. If they choose not to do anything, then we have the conversation and we have it in their file. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I know earlier you mentioned that a lot of dentists are using uh, flash drives to uh, transfer data. So uh, mm -hmm. Tony actually asked, are there? Do you know of any uh, HIPAA compliant external devices such? drive USBs that are available to transfer or move data with? Yeah, there, there are actually a great many of them. Um, we found the best ones to work are um, the hardware encrypted drives. And you can get a, an, an encrypted drive that's software encrypted or hardware encrypted. And the reason we like the hardware encrypted, there'll, there'll be a drive with like a keypad on it that you have to type in this, you know, nine digit code or something like that to get it to mount. Um, we like those because you don't need to install software on your on your machines to read the drive, which makes you know restoring from those drives very easy. Um, there is encrypted flash drives that have um, you know that have keypads, and there's also software encryption, which is which is perfectly fine. Most USB flash drives can actually be encrypted, um, and then if you're using you know Windows 7 Professional or something like that, then you can you can always encrypt um, with the onboard operating system. So it's definitely doable, and, and many times it's actually no added cost. Okay, I see. 
So Joe is asking uh, for the non-compliant solutions that your clients are using. Obviously, you're not managing those solutions for them. But do you mm -hmm. actually put that in writing somewhere that those uh, solutions are excluded from the contract or the managed service offering? Um, we don't. Um, so let's see how to answer this. If there, if there is a consultation, like a formal consultation, then for sure it is. Um, it is detailed, documented. If there is no HIPAA consultation, then it's really just excluded from our scope. So it's like, you know, when we sign our contract with them, our service agreement, it, it specifically says what we do. It doesn't say what we don't do. Um, it just says what we do. So, you know, so if they wanted to, you know, litigate and hold us responsible for something that they do, then really there's nothing in the service agreement that would say that, that we do that because um, we're very detailed about what we do for them. Um, so that's sort of how we go about that. Ideally, we want to just have consultations with everybody, just you know, for our protection and also, you know, for them. I think it's a high value for them, um, and it's also the best way that we can really stay, um, you know, safe from their exposure. Right. Um, do you have a way to detect uh, non-compliant solutions that your current clients might be using, or um, yeah. do you check in with your clients? Um, you know, periodically to see if they are using any of those? We do. Um, yeah, the software enable that we use um, in any of these remote management software that you can get, um, they can, you can trigger alerts whenever certain software is installed or you can just look at their, um, you know, you can look at reports on what they have. Um, we do that quite a bit, actually. We, we have in our um, systems, whatever they happen to be using, we have um, expiration dates with notifications that come through Autotask, which is our CRM. So we know to check up on them every once in a while and say, hey, you know, this is the solution that you're using, which isn't compliant, you know, is expiring and, you know, now might be a good time to move to a compliant solution. An example of that would be like Carbonite Home. We see a lot of people backing that with a home version of Carbonite, which um, isn't encrypted or compliant. So what we'll do is we'll get the expiration date of that and then follow up with the client when uh, when it's set to expire. And this is really if we've met the resistance of them not wanting to give up that they've already paid for this other solution. I see. Okay, so before we um, answer more questions, I want to talk a little bit about how MSPs can start working towards compliance. Um, so, Dan, I kind of put this slide together based on what you told me. So do you want to kind of go through this and elaborate on what each of these means? Sure. Um, yeah, so, so the first thing, if you're, if you're just beginning your career with HIPAA, um, it's a great idea to, to talk to an expert. Um, there's a lot of experts out there, and there's a lot of different ways that people consult. So I always say, you know, you talk to a few people. Um, I tend to you know, be distrustful of fear-based marketing from an expert. And it's kind of a sticky subject because it's you don't want to do this, this fear-based stuff, but at the same time, you want your clients to know. Um, and, and likewise, if you have an expert consulting with you, they're going to say things that, that might be a little bit scary. But if they're, um, you know, it's giving you deadlines and all this kind of thing, then I'd probably move on to a different different person, um, but definitely get somebody to, to talk to about it that's been working in the industry for a while. Um, identifying your risks, your, you know, the risk assessment, that's your number one thing that you want to do. If you have zero policies and you have nothing in place, um, the first thing you want to do is a risk assessment. Um, and then there's, there's all kinds of documentation on how to do that, or you can have your expert help you with it. Um, the roadmap for adjustments, that's, that's part of the risk assessment, so that kind of goes um, together with that. And that's, it's really important because you'll get, you know, you might get a proposal that says, oh, you know, here's for $30,000 that can make you compliant, and maybe you don't have that kind of money, so, you know, just remember that being compliant um, means that you have a roadmap and that you can budget for it. So even if it's a year out, just the fact that you know it's coming and you're, you have these things budgeted for, um, that's enough as long as you follow through with it. Um, and again, just the yearly risk assessment is basically the same. Okay, great, thank you. So the yearly risk assessment is really the most important thing to keep up with compliance. Yeah, and you know, it's not only just the yearly, so definitely 
every year at minimum you want to review it, but in actuality when you're working, you know, within your risk assessment, you'll be updating it, you know, much more often than that. Um, you know, you'll get a new solution, you'll have to update your risk assessment, or if you plug a hole, you, you'll want to update it. So it's really like this concept of the living document. It's, um, you know, you have to definitely be aware of it all the time and not just look at it once a year. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, so uh, before I go on to answer the rest of the questions we have from the audience, I just want to let um, everyone in the audience know that eFolder offers a host of solutions that are HIPAA compliant, and we will sign business associate agreements with all of our clients. Um, we do have a we complete proper risk HIPAA risk analysis conducted by experienced professionals, and we do have written HIPAA-specific policies and procedures in place that all of our employees have to follow. We also have a trained workforce that comply with HIPAA. And we will provide clients with a letter attesting to our HIPAA compliance to take to your clients. Um, our HIPAA compliance solutions include eFolder Anchor, our business grade file sync solution, eFolder Backup, which is a file level backup solution, as well as our entire BDR line, which includes eFolder BDR for Acronis, Aperture, Shadow Protect, Replibit, and Beam. Um, so if any of you on the line want to give any of these HIPAA compliance solutions a try, uh, you can access a free trial at www.efolder.net slash free dash trial. So Dan, I know you're currently using eFolder Backup and eFolder BDR for Shadow Protect. Um, is right. it hard to get clients to adopt these solutions? Um, so the eFolder file and folder backup, that's, that's actually very easy. We, um, we bundle it with our server management. Um, service. So if we if we're managing a server, we'll bundle it in, and then it's also a pretty nice price for just um, you know somebody who just wants all the cart backup. It's uh, it's pretty attractive, I think. Uh, it's a little bit harder on Shadow Protect because it is such a high value service. It's um, you know it's really the the best of business continuity for clients. It's um, you know the ability to virtualize um, from your backup and, and really not have that much downtime you know, reduced from several hours to a day. Instead, you're down for like 15 minutes if you have the, the device configured. Um, but it is, it's a high value service and it comes at a high cost. So that's, um, that's something that's a little bit harder. Um, but eFolder file and folder backup, I think it is incredibly good. We moved to them, um, I think maybe a couple years ago and it's, it's been really great. That's good, I'm glad it's working out. Yeah, that's a good service. Um, so, you know, we do have a couple of minutes left here, so we'll try to get to some of um, the questions we haven't answered yet. Uh, so, Nikki is asking, is there any software that you use for risk assessment, or is that um, a document that you, a template that you created? Yeah, no, there's no software that we use. It's all, um, it's paper, <laughs> and uh, you know we do use software to run our scans, and we use software to identify um, you know issues on any of our connected machines here and things like that. So there is a there's a portion of it that uses software, but in actuality, it's a big paper binder um, that just you know we add to, we write stuff up, we put it in there. Um, when you're first beginning your risk assessment, it's good to start with the template, and, and that's where you know. There's a lot of services out there that can help you with that. We um, we got our template from Compliance Helper, as I mentioned, and um, you know it's a nice starting off point. But no one template is going to do it for you. You just you know every company is different. Um, you have to adapt it, and there's no standard template that you have to follow. Um, so I don't I don't actually know that any software that's going to take you fully through a risk assessment. I think that's too hands on for a software to. Right, and. Um so you do offer HIPAA compliance as a service, right, for DMI networking? Um, HIPAA compliance as a service, we um, or I don't know that, that we do. Of, or is that just kind of, you know, bundled in and part of your managed service offering? Yeah, I mean, we, what we do is we, um, we offer HIPAA compliance on the security rule of products that we deploy. Um, mm -hmm. 
and we, we you know with the breach reporting and things like that we're, we're keeping people compliant but um, you know all of the clerical stuff for HIPAA compliance and all of the um, you know their internal policies and procedures that's not something that we offer we really just just focus on the security role right okay um, but the you know Frank is asking how do you charge um, for your HIPAA consultancy services sure so we don't honestly um, we we see it as a uh, if it's an established client we just see it as client outreach um, and if it's a um, if it's a prospect it's basically you know it's a way to get in the door and provide a, a high value service and it, the way that it pays for itself is many times you know people will end up wanting services or, or something like that but our consultations aren't sales heavy they're they're really just um, informative and I think that that's something I really like about working for this company is it's um, right. we really go for quality um, and it's something I really enjoy I, I really enjoy speaking with dentists about compliance so mm -hmm. it's it's that's pretty much how we do it we don't charge for it now if they're if they are like far away you know if they're more than like a three or four hour drive then we will charge a travel fee um, mm -hmm. but in terms of the time you know, if they're within a couple hours away, we're always in the area anyway, and it's just, um, you know, it's just a free service that we provide. Okay. Yeah, I think that's a great approach. Um, Carrie is asking, is there a general list of what your clients need to be to become HIPAA compliant? So, um, you know, when you first conduct the risk assessment, what are the, what are the main things that you're looking for in your client's office? Yeah, we have a, a checklist that's developed um, that I developed, and it's um, it basically points. You know, there's all these different items on it. it points to the paragraph in the law that that it addresses, and um, we use this as kind of a it's kind of a template for our, for our chat. Um, and it's you know, if we're able to check all the check boxes, then um, then you're compliant with the security rule at least as much as you can be without um, you know human error or a client. Um, you know modifying the services that we give to them um, so yeah for sure we we definitely use that list um, otherwise it would just be too much to keep in your head you know you, right. you really need to have yeah you really need to have it outlined and documented and then the client can look at it as well right and how do you try to keep this list updated with a um, new hardware or software requirements yeah, so um, it does get updated from time to time. Um, it's just kind of on an as-needed basis. It's not, um, you know, we don't specifically look at it all the time. But I mean, I, I look at it. We look at it all the time, but we don't look at it for changes all the time. It's um, pretty. It's pretty good the way it is. Um, you know, once in a while there there will be another solution to address one of those issues, and then we'll just work it into our consultations. But the the requirement is still the same. You know the requirement hasn't changed. Right. Okay. Um, so going back to uh, the technical safeguards, Stephen is asking: Do you use a certain tool for collecting and retaining the window logs from all machines, both workstations and servers? Yeah, we we do. So um, Enable does uh, retain the logs for us. Um, we also use LogMe in the, the central version, which let, gives us access to the logs. It doesn't always um, parse them for us, but we can. For example, I can um, get on a server and I can and I can grab the logs on it from from Enable. Um, and uh, really, it's it's just you know it's just one of the services that they give you. It's uh, you know the ability to really monitor everything. Right. Um, so Pete is wondering how you handle non-compliant, unencrypted uh, workstations from your clients that come into your office for additional work. I think you mentioned that uh, you guys will work on that machine in the separate room, right? Yes. Um, yeah, we, we generally, um, Usually what we're working on is OS level stuff that, that doesn't need a network connection. So as long as we keep it locked up, um, you know, and then we also have our form which just gives the timeline of, of how long it's going to be here. Um, you know, and that is kind of a point, um, you know, that is kind of a point because you're traveling with non-encrypted data and sometimes when you're going to pick up that machine, 
and that is a risk. Um, with every job, we have our clients sign off that we're taking their computers and that this is what that what our process entails kind of and it's very general but it's um that is an exposure risk and it's definitely part of it um it's our highest exposure risk and it's um it's one that we work very hard to, to limit i see um so we are at the top of the hour here and uh before we end the webinar dan is there any final advice or best practices you want to share with msps on the line who are trying to become hipaa compliant Sure. I think um, just to keep in mind that there's so many different ways to address um, any one issue. So just the more educated you can you can get yourself on the law and through your panel of experts or, or however you're um, learning about the law is just to keep open to uh, you know there's more than one solution out there. So you'll find something that works for you. Um, if anybody has any questions, they're definitely welcome to email me. I'm Dan at dminetworking.com. And I'm happy to talk about uh, you know any specific issues that people are working on. Um, but yeah, I mean, just just kind of keep it up in mind. There's not one there's not one best solution for any one portion of the law. And um, there are best practices that you can adopt for some of it, but um, a lot of it is going to be tailored with the data. I see. Well, Dan, thank you so much for us today and spending the time to share your expertise with everybody on the line. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so for those of you on the line, um, I apologize if we didn't get to your questions. Um, if you if you want, you may submit them. You can send me an email and I will try my best to work with Dan and get you the answer. And again, the slides and the recording for today's webinar will be sent out shortly. Uh, thank you all again for attending. I hope you all have a great day. Bye-bye.